Hi everybody, welcome to Inspirited Live. I'm John Spellman and tonight we're going to be talking about the roots of restlessness. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will bless us this evening as we study your word and we study this topic of restlessness and its roots. We pray that you would guide us and give us wisdom and understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to start off by looking at uh, James chapter 3 and verse 16. So James chapter 3 and verse 16. The Bible says, For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. In the English Standard Version, it puts it this way. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, uh, there will be disorder and every vile practice. So there are many things that, that can prevent us from finding true rest in Jesus. Some of, the, uh, some of these things are obvious and, and, and don't require much attention, but others may be less obvious um, at least to us, just as with the, the um, aspen tree and how its roots, uh, the much larger organism is beneath the ground. And, and uh, you know, you don't really see that when you look at it from the surface level. Um, and much like the iceberg, you know, you see the tip, but you don't really realize the massive, uh, you know, thing that's, that's beneath the surface. Um, in the same way, we may not always be conscious of the attitudes and actions that separate us from our, from our Savior. And when you think about the aspen tree and the roots that are underground, it creates this like massive network of roots that kind of like go all over the place and, and you know, are um, interconnected with the, uh, with, with the ground. Um, and so a lot of things that go on with us are interconnected and, and uh, beneath the surface and we don't always realize them. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 to 39, uh, Jesus talked about being, bringing division. Which is interesting because in Isaiah chapter nine verse six, Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. So if he's the pre if he's the Prince of Peace, why does he also talk about bringing division? Let's take a look at that passage. We're going to go to Matthew chapter ten and verse uh, thirty four to thirty nine. We're going to read uh, starting from verse thirty four. Jesus said, "Think not that I am come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword." For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. And he that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. So it's interesting that the Prince of Peace should make the statement, don't think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I came not to bring peace, or not to send peace, but a sword. So, in what way is Jesus the Prince of Peace? Remember that the peace that he was talking about was not peace necessarily uh, from a human standpoint, but peace or reconciliation between God and humanity. That's the peace, so that, that, that's the peace that Jesus came to bring. So conflict and, and division will often result because of God's word uh, and often with those who are closest to you because of what you stand for. And so in that way, um, in, rather than bringing peace, the word of God can bring division because there are some people who just don't want to live it and they don't want you to live it. And they're going to do whatever it takes to dissuade you or discourage you or to do things their own way or to push their mode of thinking or philosophy on you so that you can't follow the will and, and the law of God. Um, so there is always going to be that division, um, you know, um, in, at least in this life, uh, because people are so adverse to the word of God. Um, but yet, Jesus came to bring peace in the sense that we can have peace with God, and God, um, you know, can bring us into a closer relationship with him. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 35 to 39, it's really, it's really about allegiances and loyalty. And as Jesus is saying these words, he's actually quoting from Micah chapter 7 and verse 6. And Jesus challenges his audience to make choices for eternity. Sometimes the word of God is going to bring you into conflict with the people closest to you. And in situations where that occurs, what do you do? So it's not that 
Jesus was saying that people shouldn't love their parents or that parents shouldn't love their children. That wasn't the point of his message. The point was really that if that love um, would trump the hearer's commitment to Jesus, then a, a, tough commi a, a tough decision would be required. So in other words, when, when it's, it's not that God is telling us not to love our families or not to love our children, not to love our parents, but what he's saying is that when it comes into conflict with the word of God, and, and we're faced with that tough decision, we have to choose our allegiance with God over even over our allegiance with, with family members or friends or those closest to us. As painful as it is to do that. Jesus expresses this choice by formulating three sentences, each using the term worthy. Worthiness is not based on high moral standards or even overcoming sin. In this case, worthiness is based on one's relationship with Jesus. We are worthy when we choose him above everything else, including father, mother, or children. We choose the suffering of the cross and we follow Jesus. So in each case, um, now don't get me wrong, like, you know, obedience and, and uh, you know, having high, uh, overcoming sin, having high moral standards is all part of the equation. But the emphasis here is on whom our greatest relationship is with. Um, as it says here in, in the text, you know, he that loveth, um, father or or mother more than me is not worthy of me he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me so the 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 the, the, the supreme relationship as close as these relationships may be the supreme relationship is the relationship that we have with christ that's the one that that must not be compromised Let's take a look next at Luke chapter 12, uh, verse 13 to 21. I'm going to read that one next. The Bible says, And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother, he, he, that, that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made, uh, who made me a judge or divider over you? Or in the King James Version, uh, the New King James Version, I think it says uh, arbitrator. And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesses. And he spake uh, a parable unto them, saying, A ground of a certain rich man was brought forth, uh, brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have so much, I have no room where to bestow my fruits, and he said, "This I will, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. <coughs> Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry." But God said unto him, "Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall all those things be?" which thou hast provided. So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So the issue here is that the rich man was selfish and focused on his wealth. And Jesus was warning against the, the, the concept of selfishness, making, uh, making money the center focus to the replacement of God. So in other words, having an inheritance is not a bad thing. Having money or wealth is not a bad thing in and of itself. But when those things take the priority to the point where one is not rich toward God, then those things become uh, a problem because they distract the attention from God. And what's interesting is that, um, you know, while Jesus is asked this question just before he begins uh, reciting this parable, uh, Jesus responds to the question by rejecting the role of arbitrator uh, between the two brothers. But in a way, he seems to both uh, speak, to, he speaks to this issue between the two brothers indirectly uh, warning them against this concept of, of covetousness. Uh, because on the one hand, um, you have one brother who doesn't want to share or divide the inheritance, and then you have the other one who's overly concerned about the inheritance to the point where he's going to ask Jesus to ask his brother um, to divide the inheritance. 
Um, and so Jesus points out that, hey, it's really not about that. And that's not really the, you know, these are not the issues that I came here to solve. I'm not here to be the arbitrator between you and your brother. I'm here to point you to salvation, to a greater inheritance uh, that nobody can take from you, that nobody can withhold from you. And so as Jesus begins to, um, you know, denounce the role of, of arbitrator uh, between the two brothers, um, he opts to put his finger on the bigger underlying problem, which was namely selfishness. He digs deeper uh, to show the root mass underneath the individual action. So in other words, the issue between the two brothers is, is just at the surface level. That's just one problem. The real root that brings about that issue is the issue of selfishness in and of itself. And so he says, beware of covetousness. And he warns that a person can be rich in this world's goods, but not rich towards God. And the problem is that if, you're, if your soul is required of you, then what? So you can hoard goods, you can hoard money, you can hoard resources. But at the end of the day, if you're not rich toward God, um, you know, what are you going to do in the judgment? And selfishness is not just about money, but it, it takes uh, a lot of different um, faces uh, within within our lives. It affects our relationships with others, with family members, spouses, church family, uh, our neighbors, our colleagues at work. It, it takes many different different forms. So when we think about how we can overcome selfishness, uh, Philippians chapter two verse five to eight gives us the mindset that we need to have in order to overcome it. So I'm going to go to Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 8. The Bible says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So we can see here how Jesus made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant. Rather than coming to be served, he came to serve. Uh, and so the Bible tells us in verse 5 that this is the mind, this is the mindset that we as followers of Christ need to have. We have to, we have, to have the mindset of Christ. And that mindset was rather than exalting and rather than looking to be served, we are to be humbled and to serve others. So this mindset causes us to be more concerned with, with, um, with others rather than self. And that would bring about healing to many different forms of relationships. So by focusing solely on his own deeds and, and, and his own ambitions, the anonymous rich man in Jesus' parable forgot to take into consideration the unseen realities of heaven. And Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 8 describes the blueprint for unselfishness, humility, and love. If love for God and others does not drive our choices and our priorities, we will continue to build more barns for ourselves here in this life, just like the rich man in uh, Jesus's parable, and put less treasure in heaven, and then we'll come to realize that that's a poor investment. So again, there's nothing wrong with material possessions in and of themselves, but when those things uh, take the place of God in our lives or take the, the place of God's purposes in, uh, or God's will in our lives, then those things can become a problem. Okay, so I see um, there's a comment coming in. Let me go ahead and grab it. You are... Hey, John, can you hear me? Well, thanks for having me on the program and saying hi to everyone else and each one individually, personally. And... Um, I think you handled that part about the finances and being rich toward, uh, in goods, but not rich toward God well. I think you discussed that pretty well, John. Um, I just want to bring out the point. I, I want to look at Micah, if you want to turn there with me. Micah, please turn there with me if you can. Micah chapter 7, verse 6. It says, for, Jesus says, For son dishonored father, daughter rises against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own household. Verse 7, 
Therefore, I will look to the Lord. I'll wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. So the this person that wrote Micah, he was saying that there's there's a sword, so to speak, against the mother-in-law and daughter-in-law and daughter and mother and mother-in-law. And that type of, type of relationship, the son dishonors father. It wasn't that it wasn't that God wanted to destroy relationships. That's not the case. God is the God of relationships. He loved relationships. But he wanted to make sure that we could see that following Christ can then sometimes put you at odds with your family, with the ones closest to you. And uh, it can do that. And um, But it also gives it ready. It gives the answer in verse 7. Therefore, I will look to the Lord. I'll wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. So Jesus first. Jesus number one. Put him at the first of your list. Get, put him at the top of your list. Put him as the devotions in the morning. In the morning, do your devotions with the Lord. So this will make sure, it will ensure that you put God first. You have your priorities right. You put God first. And then you can go out and share the word, word with other people. And then you can be a good son and a good daughter and a good mother, a good father, a good son, good good whatever. And you can do that. Why? Because you put your priorities straight. You got Jesus first. Um, is the fact that, you know, like in churches, like, for example, with the uh, Jehovah Witnesses, they actually have uh, people kind of separate from their families once they join the church. And the mindset is that, you know, your family is of a different mindset. They're not of this church and therefore they're going to take your attention away from things. So if you're going to minister to your family, that's one thing. Um, but you but it, it kind of um, has tended to limit um, uh, interactions uh, because, and, and, you know, the idea is that, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be too busy doing things for the kingdom. Um, now that's, an, that's one approach that some people take where they, they, they anticipate division within that, within their families and within their households so much because of their faith that they end up cutting everybody off. Now the Bible isn't telling us to do that. It's not telling us not to have relationships with our friends and with our family. But then there are those times when family members make it difficult to follow God and they will do things, you know, they, they, there are ways in which parent, uh, parents or other family members have ways of punishing people who don't conform uh, to um, the dictates or the mandates of what the family wants to do. Uh, there are different examples of that. You know, it may be that, you know, hey, if you don't do X, Y and Z, we take the inheritance. If you don't do X, Y and Z, then we're not going to talk to you. Uh, if you don't do such and such, then, you know, whatever else the consequences may be. Um, and so family will put pressure on individuals um, to do, you know, or to, or to compromise in certain ways. Um, you know, if you don't show up to this event that's on the Sabbath, then, we're, you know, we're going to be upset. If, if uh, you don't support this, then, you're, you know, you're a bigot and, and uh, you know, you're a horrible person. You know, so people do that. Um, and so Jesus anticipated correctly uh, that division can result as, as you know, coming from um, those who are followers of his word because other people just don't want to accept um, the word of God. Um, so the question then becomes, well, how do you handle that? Do you go to the extreme of saying, well, we're not going to have anything to do with other family members, friends, neighbors, etc. at all ever? Uh, unless it's going to be like directly as, you know, through, through uh, Bible study or something of that nature. Or, you know, um, do you conform to the dictates of the family when it comes into conflict with God's word? Well, clearly from the scripture, we're not to conform. Um, but at the same time, we're also not to, you know, separate ourselves completely. You know, the, every situation does not necessitate that. Um, so there has to be a, a, a balance where a person has to say, okay, you know, this far and no further, you know, you know, I, I can't do this. This is, this goes against my, my beliefs. You have to be willing and, and able to stand up to family members when they want and choose to do the wrong thing and include you in it. Um, and that's not, uh, that's not always easy to do. You know, for some people, they may have to, um, you know, cut off family members or, or friends uh, when they're insistent um, even to the point of going to extremes, uh, with, with, withdrawing you into doing something that you know is, un, is, is not right. Uh, on the other hand, 
you know, as long as people are willing to respect where you're coming from and, and, and uh, even they may, they may not necessarily agree, but as long as they're willing to respect it, um, then you don't have to go to the extreme of, of, of not dealing with those, with those family members or with those friends. Um, so it's one of those situations where maybe there's no real hard, fast answer as to when a person needs to um, cut off a family member or a friend uh, versus when, you know, you continue the relationship by God's grace and, you know, witness where you can and uh, be patient where you can. Um, it's, it's hard to, to find that balance. Um, but certainly nobody should ever make you feel like when you're practicing your faith and you're, you're doing what you know is right, um, that somehow you're a bad person or somehow, um, you know, uh, you deserve, puni uh, you know, punitive measures because that person doesn't like it. Uh, let's talk about ambition. We're going to go to Luke chapter 22, verse 14 to 30. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. And he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not eat, I will not any more eat, of, eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the, in the God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread, gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, this is my body, which is given up for you. This is this do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup he, uh, after supper saying, the cup is, is the, new, the New Testament or New Covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of him that betrays me is with me on the table. And truly the Son of, the son of Man goeth as it, as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. And there was also a strife among them which of them should be accounted the greatest? And he said unto them, The kings of, of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But, he, but ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as, as he that, that does serve. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or at dinner, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat, but I am among you as he that serveth. Ye are, the, ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations, and I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So let's take a look at, at, at what Jesus said here. Now, it's interesting that while they're debating amongst themselves, trying to find out who it was that was going to betray Jesus, uh, there also seems to be a strife or a debate amongst, amongst them about which one of them was going to be the greatest. So you can see that there's this level of ambition. They knew, they had seen the miracles of Jesus. They, they, they saw his miracles. Uh, they saw all the things that he did. They knew uh, and believed that he was the Messiah. Uh, and so now they were believing, um, as many Jews did of that time period, that God was going to set up his kingdom on earth at that time. And they wanted to know amongst themselves who was going to be greatest, who was going to have high position, who was going to have the authority. So they, they were ambitious anticip in anticipation of God setting up this new kingdom. So they were kind of like putting themselves out there to see who was going to hold some, some position or some great honor. So first they were trying to figure out who the betrayer would be, and then presumably they wanted to know who had the most rank and, and who would be leader, um, you know, uh, or who would hold what leader leadership positions. So this was not the first time that this question was raised in, in, the, in the community of Jesus' followers. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 1, we see the disciples bringing the question to Jesus and framing it in a more abstract way, saying, who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Um, in Matthew chapter 18, verse 3, um, Jesus says, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So when Jesus would answer this question, 
uh, he often flipped their concept of leadership or their concept of being great upside down. Conversion is foundational for finding true rest in Jesus. We cannot depend on ourselves, but need to rely on Jesus. We experience a transformation of our, of our values and ambitions because of what Christ does in us. And Jesus tells his disciples, trust me and rely on me as this child does in, in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 3. Uh, and so it's not about ambition and, and, and holding positions and, and titles. Even today in, in churches, people are over obsessed with things like that. You know, they care about titles and positions and, oh, I want to be uh, I want to have this level of respect because I hold this position, you know, and it's not about that. Um, the, the purpose of having a position is to serve in that capacity, not to, to, to lord it over people and to make them feel like you're better than them. That's not the purpose of position and leadership. And, and Jesus often had to get his disciples to understand that uh, because their concept of leadership was more grounded in, 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 in how the Gentiles did things. So unfortunately, it seems that the disciples had not yet learned this lesson by the time that Jesus ate the Last Supper with them because they were still bickering and fighting and it even ruined, uh, it even may have ruined the moment of perfect communion uh, that was that was never to be repeated. But despite this pathetic discussion amongst amongst Jesus' followers, Jesus still did not give up on them. Uh, and this is a lesson for us that we often have to check our ambitions because sometimes when we seek after positions and power and titles and, and you know degrees and things like that, we can be missing the point and missing an opportunity to serve or to or to uh, be able to appreciate communion with Christ. And so we become restless in wanting degrees and titles and positions and, and totally miss the opportunity to rest in Christ and uh, to fulfill the purpose for which he um, has us where we're at. Uh, see, Andrew's got to come. Let me uh, go ahead and take it. You are on. Um, I want to say thank you for having me on the program, John. Uh, I this is what I got. This is the nugget that, that I got out of it in Luke chapter twenty-two, verse uh, twenty-eight. It says, "But you are those who have continued with me in my trials." So Jesus was with his twelve disciples, and they continued with him in his trials and his suffering, and uh, they've they've been with him. They've been with him in the feeding of the four thousand, the feeding of the five thousand, the raising of Jairus's daughter, some of them at least, and um. He, they've been with him with the miracles and the healings. And so he was he was saying that, but you are those who have continued with me in my trials in verse 29, and I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my father bestowed one upon me. Verse 30, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And quote New King James Version. So, Obviously, there's a great reward for suffering, even though you, you, when you suffer with Christ, there's a great reward. So you don't want to lose heart. You don't want to go away. You don't want to backslide because God has a great reward for you. And he loves you. He cares for you. He died to set you free. And he died for you when you're yet sinners, The Christ tells us in the Bible. So um, he, and he doesn't want you to fade away. He doesn't want you to lose heart because there's a great reward. And and there's a great reward in heaven for you. And even though we suffer, even when we go through temptations and trials, God can aid us in those temptations. God can aid us, aid us in those trials. Praise him in the storm. Praise him in the storm. Praise him inside the storm. Um, next, I'd like to talk about hypocrisy. So a hypocrite is somebody who play acts uh, who wants to appear to be somebody that he or she is not. Uh, the term typically would refer to like people who were actors in plays back in, in um, you know, the ancient times. So if one was an actor, uh, they, were, they were purposely pretending to be something that they were not, uh, you know, in order to um, entertain their audience. So the term is used seven times in Matthew chapter 23, uh, in Jesus' discourse where he's addressing and publicly shaming the scribes and the Pharisees. He, he, he repeatedly called them hypocrites, or, or in this uh, context, he's, he's referring to them as actors, meaning um, they're acting a part, but yet they're really not that part. 
Um, so they do the, the big issues were that they they did things to be seen of, of others, to keep others from from entering into the kingdom of God. Uh, they would put heavy burdens on people that they themselves would not would not um, follow through with. Um, they didn't they well while, while they were uh, keeping others from entering the kingdom of God, they themselves weren't even entering in. Uh, they were making diff things difficult for for other people while uh, making uh, while while taking it easy on themselves and of course being selfish. So the, the big thing was that they were doing things to be seen by other people and to be looked at and called rabbi or or teacher or you know um, you know some great title. And Jesus publicly addressed uh, this issue and uh and shame them for these practices now theologically jesus had more in common with the pharisees and the scribes than he did not so he wasn't addressing the issue of their doctrinal beliefs but rather the issue of their practice um so in the, in the spectrum of judaism in the first century a.d the pharisees uh were basically the, the really uh conservative group that kind of held to the teachings of the bible the you know the law and the prophets um that kind of kept um things going you know jesus himself said that they that the, the scribes and the pharisees sit in moses's seat uh so they seem to have had um the correct doctrines for the most part the issue was with their practice uh, and and how their faith played out in action not with their um biblical understanding per se now on the other side of the spectrum you had the sadducees which was a group mostly of mostly wealthy leaders often associated with the elite priestly class. They were highly Hellenized, which means that they were greatly influenced uh, by Greek culture during that time period. Because remember, uh, by this time, um, Alexander the Great's kingdom had conquered and the Greeks had taken over the then known world. And so many cultures, many civilizations were Hellenized uh, and began to adopt not only Greek language, but Greek philosophy and understanding of things. And so Greek culture greatly permeated Jewish culture uh, in that time period and influenced in some ways um, Ju the Judean religion uh, amongst some groups of people, specifically the Sadducees. Um, and so as a result of Greek culture influencing um, Judea you know, some, some people within Judaism, there were these sect of, of Jews who did not believe in the judgment did not believe in the afterlife, and I believe they also didn't believe uh, believe in angels, if I remember correctly. Um, and so we could describe them as like kind of like the extreme liberals. So in today's terms, the um, Pharisees and scribes would be like the conservative right, whereas the Sadducees would be like the liberals, where like you know, it's it's not so much by the book, pretty much anything goes, um, you know. Greek culture had greatly influenced them, and so a lot of Greek ideas were beginning to influence how they understood and how they practiced their religion. So there were a lot of compromises there. Now, with the conservative uh, group, the, the, the scribes and the, 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 the scribes and the, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees, um, you had this sort of doctrinal consistency, but at the same time, uh, how they carried it out uh, was the problem. Um. <clears throat> and in Jesus's eyes, both groups were guilty of hypocrisy. According to Jesus, we are hypocrites if we do not do what we say. And uh, number two, if we, if we make religion harder for others without applying the same standards to ourselves, that also makes us full of hypocrisy. Third, if we want others to applaud our religious fervor, um, you know, in other words, we're doing things to be, sh to be to be seen by other people and to say, oh, wow, you know, he's so great. He's so holy. He's so wonderful. Uh, so in other words, when we're putting on a show for others, that also is a, is a, 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 an aspect of uh, hypocrisy. And fourth, when we require honor and recognition that belongs only to our Heavenly Father, that makes us hip hypocritical. Uh, so they were taking titles and, 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 and acknowledgments that really were due to God and should not have been Put upon people so no matter no matter how sharp and to the point jesus's words were were um as he as he engaged these 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 hypocrites he still was was full of love and concern even for those who he considered to be hypocrites in other words jesus wasn't just berating them as if he didn't like them 
he was um, addressing these issues with them because he wanted to save them too. So it wasn't that he was that he didn't like the, the, scri- the scribes and the Pharisees, or it wasn't that he didn't like the Sadducees. It was more along the lines that he was concerned for them and he wanted them to be saved. And he recognized that the course that they were currently on would cause them to lose their salvation and 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 not be able to find rest in him. So Jesus's engagement with those who he called hypocrites was nevertheless full of love and concern, even for the hypocrites. Now, another important point to bring out here is that a person does not necessarily need to be a religious leader in order to be guilty of hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is all about saying one thing while doing the complete opposite. Um, You know, portraying yourself one way when you're living something different. So in many ways, um, anybody can be a hypocrite and and, and be um, in danger of the same warning or rebuke that Jesus Jesus gave here in, uh, in Matthew chapter 23. So the idea here is that we need to examine our lives and make sure that we're in line with what we profess. Next, let's take a look at uprooting restlessness. We're going to take a look specifically at John chapter 14, verses 1 to 6. The Bible says, Uh, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you you may be also. And whither I go, you know. And the way you know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, And how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So the key to overcoming division, selfishness, ambition, hypocrisy, and truly finding rest in Christ is to believe in what Jesus taught, knowing that we have a place with him uh, through faith in Christ. Overcoming restlessness always begins with Jesus. Without Jesus, we can't have an end to restlessness. We can't have an end to worry. Because he is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the only answer that we have to the sin problem. Uh, He's the only answer that we have to reconciliation with God. Without him, we can't have that that reconciled relationship. And it's interesting, you know, you hear about people using all these, like, new age methods. You know, you have people, like... Uh, into the Kabbalah, into uh, the meditation and the Toltec wisdom and all these other things that people do these days. Um, Because what those things do is that they provide a substitute um, for having a direct relationship with God. Uh, So when you go back into into history and you look at how Kabbalism, for example, came about, and a lot of these New Age uh, philosophies and religions are all based on this Jewish mysticism and other forms of mysticism as well. And the the problem with the mysticism... well. To go into the history of the mysticism without getting like too detailed, because that's not really our topic for tonight, uh, it came about as a result of um, when when God um, had brought them into ca- the, the the children of Israel into into captivity um, as a result of their disobedience. Um, they were seeing that they weren't getting any answers from God, and so they said, "Okay, well, if God is not going to come to us, if God isn't going to send the Messiah to us, then we'll go to Him." And so they, they, they got this, these ideas borrowing from the pagan religions of the time periods uh, where they, through meditation, through, um, you know, um, uh, there's another term, through, um, like, it's a certain type of thinking. I forgot the technical name for it, but it's a certain type of thinking. Um, and, and through this uh, experience and through, through um, the, these mysticist uh, approach, approaches, um, they would bring themselves to the very throne of God. And they believe that through positive thinking, through um, meditation, concentration, and visualization, uh, that they could bring themselves to God and to his throne and, and, and access uh, uh, heaven by those means. And so um, remember that when Jesus came on the scene, the Jews had rejected Christ. And so 
in fulfillment, you know, Christ was the fulfillment of all of the biblical prophecies. And so once you, ex you reject Christ, then what do you have? Uh, you know, all of the promises, all of the, the, the prophecies are now empty because uh, if, if Christ isn't who he said he was, then all of those prophecies have been left unfulfilled. And so what people began to do at that time was to seek a new way, a new means of trying to reach God and to make those prophecies uh, appear to have been fulfilled, uh, mainly by changing the mindset of the people. So what ends up happening is that those who rejected Christ, you know, their faith um, in many ways may have become empty. And so uh, to fill that void and to provide answers for people who couldn't understand, well, why are we still under this captivity? Why are we still under the rule of the Romans? Why uh, hasn't the Messiah come? Why aren't we experiencing heaven? Why are we no longer, you know, the head? Why don't we have our empire back? Why is there no king in Israel? You know, what went wrong? Mysticism um, sought to provide answers to these unanswerable questions. The true answer was, of course, in Christ. But once the people rejected Christ, they needed to provide others with a new answer. And this Jewish, this form of Jewish mysticism, which later became known as uh, Kabbalism, uh, was pretty much the uh, result of that. And it still continues even, even to this day, just in many different forms. Now you not only have it within Judaism, but you have it in many different religions, um, you know, in, in, in different um, philosophies and religions um, around the world. So the idea is trying to replace God uh, with this mystic approach, which allows you to go up to heaven or even to see divinity within yourself, as opposed to going to God. And while it gives people um, this sort of like mantra that they can follow, or it, it gives people a new way to think about life, in reality, it's not really going to impact your, your, your surroundings. It's not really going to impact your, your environment. It's really about changing how you think in order to adapt to life as opposed to going to God who can have an outcome on your circumstances. And so that is what has replaced uh, faith in God um, and again, in, in the New Age religions, it, it's, it's, it comes in different forms, but all of these things are, are virtually the same. Uh, the practices are even the same. Visualization, meditation, and all those sort of things. You know, all of them, all of these practices are virtually the same. And it's, it's, it's trying to provide people with an alternative to going to Christ and finding rest in Christ. And so the problem, though, is that you still have restlessness because it may take some time. But people will begin to realize that really none of these things solve problems. They can solve temporary issues. They can change how you think about problems. But the things, the issues are really there. All that's changing is perhaps how you respond to it. But Christ offers us something so much different and so much better. He offers us an opportunity to have rest in him and to overcome the challenges of this life. So in other words, Christ isn't only about changing how you think about your problems. He's about changing the, 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 the situation entirely and giving you the hope that one day your problems will not be problems because God has the power to bring restoration to this world. That is something that no religion of the world can offer other than uh, Christianity. So that's why we can confidently say that overcoming restlessness always begins with Jesus. Through these Eastern philosophies and religions, you can think about entering into heaven. You can meditate. You can go through all kinds of mental um, gymnastics and think that you've arrived or, or, or feel good or have these ecstatic ex experiences or mystic ex experiences. But in reality, you haven't left the room that you're in. You know, you may have uh, thought a certain way or maybe your mind will do certain things for you. That can happen. But in reality, nothing has changed. In Christ, however, everything changes. And so God is not just a form of mental gymnastic. 
God has the power and ability to impact and to and to um, influence your present circumstances and to change the reality of this world. We have the promise that one day this world is going to come to an end and that we will have a literal, real, everlasting life in a world where sin and the pain and suffering that it brings does not exist. And Jesus says that um, he is the way, the truth, and the life that brings us to the Father so that we can enjoy and participate in this experience. As the divine lawgiver, Jesus himself is the personification of truth. And the Spirit has been sent to this world has been sent to this earth in order to guide us into all truth. When we hurt, when we're tired, when we're worn out, when we're sick, when we're discouraged, Jesus is the life. And not just any life, but he brings us everlasting life and also gives us the ability to live a different quality of life here on, on, in this world. So not only do we have the promise of everlasting life to come, um, you know, at the end of time, but we also have the ability to live an abundance of life here in this life because God can impact our present circumstances. And so Jesus could confidently say, let not your heart be troubled. And th in, this, in these words was an invitation to live in anticipation of God's goodness. Because God is able to put us on a higher plane. And, and, and when we struggle with darkness and sin, he is, he's the one um, who not only began, but will also finish the work that has been started within us. And we have this, this um, promise that he is preparing a place for us. A place where there will be no pain, no restlessness, and no suffering. Uh, all those things will be banished away. All those things will be done away with. <clears throat> and we can come to God in our weakness, in our hurt, in our brokenness, and in our general fallen state, knowing that he accepts us despite these things. And this shows us his grace. Because he gives us this unmerited favor, despite the fact that we haven't earned it, despite the fact that we don't, that we don't deserve it. And all we must do is believe that we have been given uh, this grace if we seek it by faith. Let's take a look at Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 22. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 22. The Bible says, Return ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. God requires us to return to him. That's what he wants from us. He wants us to return to him, to repent. And he promises that if we return, so we make the choice to return, God can't force us to return. He's not going to make us do it, uh, but he gives us the choice to do it. And if we return, he promises to heal our backsliding, to, to change the things that are wrong with us. He tells us that I will again, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. But we don't get to enjoy that unless we first return to God and, and, and he has our backsliding healed. Because if we stay in the present condition that we're in, then we don't have everlasting life to enjoy. But if we return to him, then we can enjoy this, pro uh, you know, our, our, the promise uh, that he has a place prepared for us. And so we can find rest in Jesus in that he offers us a solution to life's problems. He offers us a better life in the world to come. He offers us um, freedom from sin and hypocrisy. Uh, he offers us a different way of thinking about ambition. Uh, rather than our selfish ambitions, he gives us meaning and purpose that, that brings ultimate fulfillment. Rather than selfishness, he gives us um, 
opportunity to live for others um, and, and to be a blessing to others. And rather than division with God, he allows us to experience reconciliation. So Jesus allows us to find rest even in the midst of restlessness. And while the roots of restlessness lead to so many different types of problems and just different think, you know, different in different ways, Jesus gives us the opportunity to overcome that. Because he understands, you know, the roots, like in the lesson we talked about uh, the aspen tree, right? And how the uh, the roots of the aspen tree are like this whole network that's a lot bigger, uh, you know, can go and, uh, you know, they say that those roots can live, uh, you know, for thousands of years, whereas the tree itself may only live for hundreds. Um, but, but the roots can last for, um, you know, thousands, like I said, and, and, and there's this whole big, huge network of them underground that nobody really sees. And that's pretty much the way our lives are with the sin problem. There's so much, so many issues that, that are networked and, and, and interconnected, uh, so many problems that we face as a result of sin. Uh, it may show itself in the surface one way, but there's a whole network of problems underneath. And Jesus has provided us a way in which to deal with that network of problems, to deal with the root, not just the symptoms. And, and, and so we can find rest in him. All right. uh, so that's all the time that we have for this week. Uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessing in reading and studying your word, and also that you provide rest for us in spite of our challenges, in spite of uh, our past mistakes. Help us, Lord, um, to take hold of your grace and to do what's right, to return to you and not to uh, continue in backsliding. We pray, Lord, that you would forgive us of our sins and help us to do what is right. In Jesus' name we pray. And help us most of all, Lord, to find rest in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming, everyone. Have a great week.